I'm Joshua Bardwell, and you're going to learn something today. I have with me Jeremy Wolf and Ryan Ladiman. And the reason they're here is because these guys are working together to break top speed records with drones. And in fact, do you guys currently hold the record? Well, Ryan does. Ryan I, does. I, yeah, still unofficially hold it. I'm working with Guinness right now, uh, so-called working with them. It's a long story, but I know why people pay a lot of money up front to just get things done quickly. Because I'm going the freeway, and you have to correlate with or correspond with them through their website, and it's just it's a nightmare. I mean, so we're going on ten months you, right now. So you yeah. might hold the you certainly you you might have a claim to the throne of the fastest yeah. drone, not drone, fastest quadcopter, whatever, and. You guys, you guys reached out to me and said, "Hey, do you want to?" You actually said, "Do you want to take a look at a black box log of a top speed drone?" And I, that, as interested I am as I am in black box, the opportunity to just hear about the process of building and flying and setting these records, I couldn't pass it up. So thank you guys so much for being here. You're welcome. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> so I guess the first thing I want to do is I want to hear from each of you what your role is in this process? What do you, what do each of you do? Best way I can describe the group is it's a bunch of engineers just nerding out, trying to figure out how to make stuff better. Yeah. Uh, a lot of, uh, two of the guys in the group, there are brothers and both have aviation backgrounds and uh, have worked in aerospace. And then the reason I got involved with the group is I reached out to Ryan cause I wanted to get one of his frames and fly at line of sight. But I wanted something that could do, you know, 130, 140 miles an hour line of sight just to, to play around. And, of course, I do FPV as well. Uh, mm. I also like doing But my majority of flying I enjoy doing is line of sight. Oh, you're one of, the you're one of those guys. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. I, I said, oh, you're one of those guys. Uh, yeah, I'm one of those guys, I guess. Yeah. There's not many of us. So what is the current unofficial record that you guys uh, believe you hold? What's the fastest you've gone? Uh, right now, average, I've gotten uh, 195.99. Are you kidding yeah, me? That, yeah, that's average. And that was taken by GPS. And the method, the GPS unit, wow. that, that's all been approved by Guinness. Yeah, but it's just these and, little details that we're trying to work out with Guinness. That's and we'll talk. We'll talk about the the way that you measure the speed. I think let's hold that for a second. Um, mm -hmm. You guys are using GPS measurements, not radar measurements, which some people will find controversial. But a little later in the interview, I want to talk about why that actually is an accurate way of measuring speed. But hold on a second, because I had heard a number of I think one sixty something, and you just said one one nine a hundred and ninety. That is insane speed. I yeah. can't believe it. Uh, can we see? I think you, it looks like you might have it behind you. Do you have the current frame that you're using? We could we could um, take a quick look at it. Well, th this one is actually the one that hit the 190. I just call it 196. And it mm -hmm. had a one-way one -way top speed of 202. Yeah. And it's important. And, tell, tell tell everybody why it's important to do a two way average when you're doing top speed records. In case anybody out there doesn't know, uh, basically because of tail tail uh, wind, right? Then you know, then that way, I mean, you could go out in a you know light hurricane, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, hit hit some crazy speed. And to prove to make that uh, point. I actually flew this one. Uh, the motors are inverted right now, but they they were, you know, normal mount. Mm -hmm. I flew this one on a really windy day. It was probably about thirty mile an hour wind, and I hit two hundred and three with it. Yeah, I, and yeah, just but obviously was, with a I wanted with a high one way. With a thirty mile, and I've seen people do this. No, no, really official record record holders, but I've seen people just sort of posting to YouTube, and they're like, "Look, I hit one hundred and seventy miles an hour." If you only do it one way, it doesn't really mean anything because you could have a thirty mile an hour tailwind, and you're only doing one forty. So by going both directions and averaging, and that's how all 
like official speed runs are done, uh, you, you sort of negate the effect of the tailwind. Um, so, uh, now I know, I can't, I, I can't help but notice that that quad doesn't look a lot like the quadcopters that really any of us are flying. And I think it speaks yeah. to some of the challenges of going fast because anybody, a, a freaking you know, $99 UAV futures build can go 60, 70 miles an hour. And to the average man on the street, they go, really, it goes that fast. I'm like, it's, it's so easy to go 70 miles an hour. And it's not hard to go 90 miles an hour, but it gets harder, doesn't it? As you, you sort of hit this, this curve where it gets much, yeah. much harder to go faster. What are some of the things that you run into as you get to that sort of curve? Aerodynamic stability is a big one. Um, like, I don't know if you saw the video that I linked over to you. I think you did. Um, I was doing 154 on a pass, and you could see how unstable my my setup was. And, we'll, and maybe was, we'll, uh, we'll, I'll get that video from you, and I'll sort of overlay it on this discussion or cut it in. Um, yeah, I did, a, I did a two-way on that one of about, a, I think it was 152 miles an hour average both ways, and that was on 4S. And then uh, wow. I think Brian, Brian did his on, you did your 202 on 6S, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, it was 6S. Yeah, I haven't been able to get mine stable enough to go to 6S, but uh, we've done a bunch of number crunching in the group to try and come up with something more stable, and uh, this is currently... What I'm working on, I'm missing the tail cones here. But the, yeah. uh, they go in here, and as you can see, it's a, a little bit different than Ryan's it's, setup. It's, it, I, I've made this argument um, a while back. I, Of course, I, I saw this coming. No, <laughs> I made the argument a while back because people were doing top speed runs with more traditional quadcopters, and I, I saw the way they were evolving. And I said, what you're going to end up with is basically a – it's not even a quadcopter anymore. It's basically a, a plane with four engines yeah. and thrust vectoring, not thrust vectoring, differential thrust. Um, your, your, your whole goal is basically just to fly straight at basically 90 degrees up tilt and in a straight line and be as aerodynamic as possible when doing that. Right. Homemade remote control cruise missiles. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's so the comments I've gotten on mine. They've been like, ah, oh, it looks like a missile. Why is aerodynamics so important in, in top speed runs? Because the amount of power to overcome the drag that you have goes up uh, with the square. Yeah, the square of the velocity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So right. one of the things you have to do is try and take advantage of the aero by reducing as much of that drag as you can. So there are another way to overcome it. Like this is what the DRL team did was use saturating the motors. Uh, they ran, they ran enough power and current into the motors that they extracted absolute maximum power that those motors were able to give, which they occurs ran at 10 s voltage, right? Pardon me. Yeah, they, they ran 10 s voltage. Yeah. And they just, just, just. Yarrr. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. And they, they sagged the battery. Uh, several yeah. ships. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so by by being more aerodynamic, what's the difference in uh, sort of aerodynamic drag or whatever the appropriate unit is? How much more aerodynamically efficient is your quad than, say, just a typical like racing quad, like a floss maybe, or or even something like a like a rooster, a freestyle quad that is really not very aerodynamic? I'd say that's a big guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would be on the Easy. on the same boat with that. Yeah. yeah. It's not easy to figure out at all. Um, but a lot, right? Yeah, a lot I'm more efficient. like a drag coefficient of, I don't know, between 1.5 to 2 versus maybe 0.2 for one of these. You so know? maybe maybe a factor of 10. Yeah. Well, to give you an okay. idea, when I was going 154 miles an hour on 4S, um, well, just say 150. On 4S, it's only drawn about 75 amps from the battery. I mean, it, that's that's really respectable. Uh, I could draw 75 amps or 100 amps and only do like 75 miles an hour on, on some quads. So, yeah, that's that's really shocking. 
Every time you say 150 miles an hour on 4S, my mind just boggles a little bit. <laughs> and I, I think it's actually going to go over 160 because it wasn't topped out according to the logs. Uh, I was yeah. running it in a plus config when I was playing around with that design. And one of my motors, the bottom one, because it wanted to nose down as it got mm -hmm. up to speed. Sure. So the bottom motor was at 100% and the other three it were like 80% and it was turning like 31,000 RPMs. Yeah. Now you, you talked about aerodynamic stability. Um, basically what you're trying to, am I right? That what you're trying to do is get the motors, if the motors have to speed up and slow down to stabilize the quad, then that's, they're not putting that work into just making it go faster. So you, right. I think what you're saying is you want the quad to be as aerodynamically stable as possible. So it just holds its attitude naturally so that the motors can focus essentially on making it go faster. Is that right, right or wrong? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's a lot like a, a dart. You know, a dart has such directional stability. Right. A rocket, you throw that thing sideways, <laughs> not going to do too well. So are you, how do you, how do you troubleshoot that? Because it's not like you have a slow-mo camera or something uh, looking at what the quad is doing in the air. How do you decide what it's doing and what it needs to do and how to get from point A to point B? I've started picking up computational fluid dynamics and running simulations in order to start finding uh, where the pressure's coming from. Uh, it's I don't have enough computing power to do drag because it requires quite a detailed model in order to do that. Sure. Lots of tiny little, tiny the, little cells. The good news is like a lot of times when you try and aerodynamically model a quadcopter, it's a very, very complicated shape. The good news is yours is basically a tapered cylinder. So if you did model it, hopefully the math wouldn't be that complicated. Well, the big part that we're, we're really working on now is in the front, because what mm -hmm. we want to do is we want to have as much laminar airflow before it becomes turbulent. So the faster you go, the sooner that air is gonna break off from what's called the boundary layer, which is sitting here. So the air is actually sitting on the wall here and it's almost stationary until mm -hmm. it gets back where the turbulence and it starts separating. And of course, by the time it gets to the prop line, it's gonna become very turbulent. So right. the key part is the very, the very front part here. And then the faster you go, the the less you're going to be able to take advantage of laminar flow if you're able to get it. Yeah, yeah. And I guess do you do you, do you try and uh, create the, you know a small amount of lift so the motors don't have to fight to keep it from from tumbling over, or is it is that is yes. that the pendulum rocket right. fallacy all over again? No, we actually are trying to get lift, and that's actually if you if you can see here, these are actually wing well mm -hmm. airfoils, so uh -huh. they're. Mm -hmm. They're based off of a symmetrical NACA profile. And one of the big questions that we had uh, as a group is trying to figure out how this body itself behaves, which is a revolved NACA profile. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's still a question until I actually get the flat, which will hopefully be this weekend. Yeah, so we, we want to see uh, if the calculations are correct. Yeah, ahead, right. And, and like you were saying about the lift, we need to, we need to balance the moments around the center of gravity to make sure we're flying as straight as possible to keep the thrust as horizontal as possible. Um, right. Then you, get, you get the highest speed that way. Um, but you can't tell until you're at top speed exactly right. how you're going to be situated. Like you don't really have, would a, would a wind tunnel really help you out if you guys had access to that? It, not really, because wind tunnels, there you really have to know what you're doing with one of those, right. um, because you don't know what speed or what angle of attack your props are going to be for your quad uh, until you actually fly it. Because if you, if you have that off, you, you don't know how much your props are unloaded. You don't know exactly what speed you're going to be at. In, in a, you know, you might get some right. data from the wind tunnel and it's not going to be accurate. Yeah. So it basically it's just uh, flying by the seat of your pants. Fortunately, we don't need any uh, actual live humans to go up and break the sound barrier and put their lives at risk. We can just do it remotely. <laughs> right. And uh, how, when, how, I was going to say when you dump into the ground, 
you know, nobody has to parachute out and eject. How many of these guys have you disintegrated in midair, crashed into the ground? You know, what, how many frames have you built at this point? Hmm. <laughs> he has to count. Right. <laughs> See, I'm at about four now, I think. Oh, um, that's not too bad. That's not too bad. If you, there, I'll send you the video for my very first flight when I was trying this out. It lasted about half a second. Oh, my God. 55 degree camera angle taken off from a vertical standpoint and yeah. being used to quads that way, you know, maybe 400 grams all up weight and then switching over to something that's 1100 grams. When you go to pop it up, it didn't quite go as high as is expecting. What do you, what do you put? What, what are you pulling out there, Ryan? I <laughs> see oh, you've got yeah, these are broken a bunch stuff. Of frames I've gone through in the past. See, my biggest issue is that I will, I'll build a frame and come up with something new to try out or whatever, and I'll just rebuild it. But I, I right. have probably crashed about uh, maybe three of them lightly, one of them medium, and then one was pretty rough. Uh, I mean, sm just smashed it the smithereens. I mean, the, the good news is that you're not exactly trying to do you know proximity freestyle. So you basically point the nose down, jam the throttle, and cross your fingers. But as long as it doesn't disintegrate or go out of control, there's nothing really to crash into, I guess, except the ground. So. Well, actually, flying at high speed is a little more challenging than uh, what it appears at first because oh, well, you to try I'm and make it <laughs> level and mm -hmm. keeping it at your same height is right. it's quite tricky and any little input you give it yeah. all of a sudden becomes a large moment so oh my gosh back really quickly like in my previous design when i was going and i'd it would nose down and then i'd let off and nose up it would gain easily 100 feet of altitude and i was off the throttle it was just coasting right i guess because when you're going that fast there's so much uh, drag or air pressure that if you nose up, it pushes it up really quickly. And of course, and when any... go ahead. And it also cuts through the air really well. So it doesn't just a normal quad, like something lightweight, like a race quad or a two frame quad that I build. When you hit it and you let off the throttle, it just kind of stops real quick because there's not oh, a whole lot of mass. It's so aerodynamic. It drag. So you have yeah. air brakes plus it's lightweight versus something that's heavy. Wow. Mm. Yeah. The other, so, uh, you know, I think we're touching here a little bit on the pilot's job in doing these speed runs. When I've tried to do speed runs, I'm not trying to break records, but if I'm just trying to see, you know, if is prop A faster than prop B, one of the things that is really challenging is maintaining altitude. Because, of course, if you yeah. descend on one run and you go flat on the other run and you climb on another run, you haven't done a real apples to apples comparison. And in your case, uh, does it? you, you want to maintain the same altitude, right? You don't want to descend or ascend Otherwise, you're, I guess descending might make you go faster, though, because your your gravity's helping you along, or yeah, no? Yeah, little, yeah, yeah, it helps you a little bit more. And that was one of the things I had to do with the Guinness World attempt was find out exactly what angle I was going at. And I was, I was pretty shocked. Uh, I can't remember the angles, but it actually averaged out. I was climbing just slightly between the, you know, between the two averages. Um, I think the highest angle I was going at was maybe two degrees, something wow. like that. Yeah. 